Hello! In the past weeks I made this little LED matrix clock. Before I show you how it's made, I first want to thank JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. This video is sponsored by JLC PCB. Upload your Gerber file to produce 10 PCBs for only $2 plus shipping. Using JLC PCB you can make many high quality PCBs for very low prices. As you may already know, I like making messy wire contractions. Using the modified TM1637 LED display and my 80 tiny 44A development board shown in the previous video, I first made this prototype. As you can see here, there are lots of wires and the buttons are not easy to press. The 80 tiny 44A has only 4K of flash memory and 256 bytes of RAM. This is just enough to display the current time on the scrolling ticker tape and use the buttons to set the time. Since I want to add more functionality and make a few more of these clocks to give to family, I needed some modules that make it easier to assemble the clock. Using ECEDA I designed these modules. I made them public so you can reuse the designs and order them yourself. For links see the description below. This development board is for the 80 tiny 85 microcontroller. As you can see it is a narrow minimal component board with room for the 80 tiny processor and header pins on one side. The other side has a reset button and an ICSP programming connector. This module replaces the modified TM1637 display module. On the front it has 5 rows of 6 LEDs. On the back you can see the TM1637 LED driver chip. The connector on this end is to connect it to the microcontroller. The connector on the other side can be used to connect three push buttons. For the push buttons I made this relatively simple board. I will show you how I designed this board using ECDA. I first started with a new schematic. I add three buttons and a four pin header. Using the wire tool I made the connections. When all is done I use this menu to make a PCB. I drag the buttons and the pin header to their place on the board and make the traces guided by the thin red lines. Each red line is connected using this wire tool. When all is ok, I add a ground plane to both sides. Then I use the text tool to add some text on the silk screen layer of both the front and the back side of the board. And then I can use the 3D view to inspect the board. You can rotate the 3D model of the board to inspect all sides of it. Once all is well, I use this menu item to generate the Gerber file. To have the PCB produced by JLC PCB, you only need to upload the Gerber file and set the required options. For my boards, I used the option Penalized by JLC PCB and entered the number of PCBs per sheet. For the display board, I also ordered a stencil for SMD reflow soldering. If you want to minimize costs, you can also penalize the board yourself. After paying the items in your shopping cart, the board is reviewed. When the audit fails, you can correct it and if needed, use email support for help. In this case, I didn't take into account the minimum size needed for penalizing. When the design goes into production, you can monitor the progress. Usually, the board is ready for shipment within two days. If you choose a more expensive shipment option, the delivery is faster. In my case, the package was delivered in only a few days. So this is the package I received. 
I eagerly opened the box and found the stencil and three shrink wrapped PCB stacks inside. Let's open the first one. This stack has the PCB for the three push buttons. Each panelized sheet contains 16 PCBs. So let's snap off one PCB to view it in detail. As you can see, the traces and the silk screen are all printed nice and sharp. But I should have put the key markings a bit further from the soldering holes. Let's unwrap the second stack. This board is for the TM1637 Mini 6x5 OED matrix. This side has room for the LED driver chip, some passive components and the header pins that connect the board to the microcontroller. The other end has room for the header pins to connect the push button PCB. On the other side of the board there is room for the LEDs that form the matrix. This board requires a bit more force. But the V-score makes it easy to snap one PCB off the sheet. By the way, sorry about that black microphone wire. I was too focused on the board to realize that it was in the shot. This board also has excellent quality, even in the MX logo in the bottom right corner of the copper layer. This is the stencil which I will unwrap later and use then to solder the LEDs onto the board. The third stack has a large number of tiny boards. Both front side and back side look alright. I carefully break off one row and snap off one board. As you can see the board is quite small and there isn't much room for text in the silk screen. The top side has numbered pins but the font size is a bit too small for each number to be printed ok. Also you can see that some text overlaps the clearing space around the pads. This PCB sheet has the largest number of PCBs. 10 boards by 4 boards is 40 boards per sheet. Having 10 sheets in the stack makes 400 boards in total. Even with the extra cost of penalizing, the production cost per PCB is less than 10 cents. The first board I want to solder is the Tiny Dev development board. As this is the first test of the PCB, I first used an ATtiny 13A chip, which is cheaper than the ATtiny 85. I first solder pin 1 of the chip and check the alignment. Then I solder the other pins. The solder I use has a resin core, so I don't need to add flux. After soldering the chip, I use some red white and blue header pins for the ISP programming connector. The blue pins go on the ground side and the red pins on the VCC side. I try to solder them at a straight angle and then check the soldering. After soldering the bottom side of the board I first solder the breadboard friendly header pins. For the reset button I will use this gold colored button. After soldering the reset button the final component is a decoupling capacitor between ground and VCC. This is how the completed tiny dev board looks. To test the board I've programmed a simple blinky sketch and connected an LED and resistor between pin 0 and ground. Then I used the USB ASP programmer to power the board. As you can see the LED blinks and the reset button also works. Finally I use a marker to mark the ground pins and to write the chip type on the side of the pin header. Now I know that the tiny dev PCB works, I do it all again with an 80 tiny 85 chip. Feel free to skip to the next board while I try to be more concise. So I snap off a PCB, then take an 80 tiny 85 chip and solder the first pin. The 80 tiny 85 is a bit wider than the 80 tiny 13A. When the chip is aligned properly, I solder the other pins. Then I break off the red, white and blue pins for the ISP programming header and solder them to the board. Next it's time to solder the breadboard friendly header pins. For the ATtiny85 board I use this button which is a bit more durable than the gold button. The last component to add is the 10 microfarad decoupling capacitor. Finally I use a marker to mark the ground pins and to write the chip type on the side of the header pins. 
To test the ATtiny85 development board, I use the same blinkage crutch as before. The next board I want solder is pretty simple. It has only three buttons and a pin header. I snap a board off and insert the through hole buttons. Their bent legs prevent them from falling out and make them easy to solder. After soldering the header pins, this is the result. The next board is more interesting, since this is my first attempt to do SMD reflow soldering. Here you see how I use tape and a piece of cardboard to make this rig for applying the solder paste. Using clear tape, I covered the stencil holes for the adjacent boards. Then I put a bit of paste on the stencil, and while keeping the stencil flat, I used a plastic card to fill all the stencil holes with paste. As you can see here, there's a blob of paste on all the pads, so I think that's just fine. After cleaning the stencil with paper, it's time to place the LEDs. I mainly use the marking on the back to place them in the proper orientation. When all the LEDs were placed, I used my hot air station at low speed at 300 degrees Celsius to get the paste to melt without damaging the LEDs. This is how the board looks after applying the heat. I think the result looks pretty nice for a first attempt. Using my multimeter, I tested each LED and they still work. Next step is to solder the components on the backside. First, I put some solder blobs on the pads for the chip and the passives. When the TM1637 chip is properly aligned, I solder the other pins. After soldering the chip, I solder the two pull-up resistors and the capacitor. Then it's time to solder the pin headers. I used male headers for the connection to the microcontroller and female headers for the connection of the buttons. When testing the matrix board using the ATtiny44 board, I found that I made a major error in the circuit design of the LED matrix. Here you can see that the top row is not lighting at all. I made some last minute changes that caused a whole row of LEDs to be disconnected. To fix this error I soldered a thin botch wire from a transformer spool between a pin of the chip on one side and to one pad of an LED on the other side. For future soldering of the botch wire, I drilled a hole in the board. This fix works fine for me, but I updated the circuit design and the PCB in EasyEDA, so you don't have to drill any holes. Since the ATtiny44A has limited memory, I pre-wired a breadboard with the new ATtiny85 development board and moved the modules to the other board. There now is room for an entire character set and I can display longer text. To make powering from a USB power bar easier, I soldered a micro USB connector onto a piece of protoboard. Then I cut off some female pin headers and soldered them to the board. Finally I connected the ground and VCC pins. Instead of the programmer, I now can use this small ISP USB adapter to power the board. To change the orientation of the buttons, I use some pliers to bend the header pins 90 degrees. Next I made a short 4 pin cable. Using this shorter cable I connected the modules together in the desired orientation. Then I used some hot glue to fixate the modules. Finally I used SketchUp and my 3D printer to create a small box. I'm not sure if this printed box will be the final housing. I do like the idea of a modular clock on a small breadboard that can be changed whenever I think of something new. If you have cool ideas for these modules, please let me know in the comments. I hope you liked this video. If you do, subscribe to be notified of future videos. Bye bye!